Hello and welcome to the Cardiometabolic Session 8. I'm Nicole Earhart, one of the adult endocrinologists at the University of Washington Diabetes Institute. And today we're excited to share our eighth session program, which includes Dr. Lorena Wright, who's the head of our Latinx clinic and an adult endocrinologist at the University of Washington. She's going to be talking to us today about access to medications. Additionally, we have some great panelists, including Portia Hong, our pharmacist, to advise us on all our pharmacy issues. We have Allison Ward, our psychologist with a specialty in diabetes and diabetes distress. We have Nyan Aurora, an adult nephrologist here at the Diabetes Institute. And then finally, we have Laura Montour, our family medicine and obesity specialist. So without further ado, take it away, Lorena. Today, we are going to talk about helping improve patient access to medications. I don't have any conflicts of interest. The objectives is to explain best practices for reading formularies, the prior authorizations, the use of coupons and some programs, regional or pharma-sponsored programs to help with patients, and we'll describe what kind of support our patients have. I think that we all have to deal with this at some point. This is not a very fun part of clinical medicine when we have to do paperwork, but at the end, it is very important to be familiar with this because this is to improve care, to provide patients with the best options. So some general terms that you might already be familiar with, but just a review. There are different types of formularies. There is the open formulary. That means that the payer may provide coverage for all formulary and non-formulary drugs. And these payers include the health plan, the employer, the PBM, which is pharmacy benefit manager. I was have to look it up, acting on behalf of the health plan or the employer. And a closed formulary, that is when the non-formulary drugs are not reimbursed by the payer. So it's important also to understand these tiers, what the drug formulary tiers, so a tier formulary divides drugs into groups, and this is mainly regarding cost. When there is tier one, for example, that means that that's usually the medications that are more affordable. The plans negotiate the pricing with the drug companies. There can be several tiers, tier one, tier two, even three or four. So then we always want to choose medications that are in tier one or tier two because of the cost. For example, this is the Walmart formulary, and this is to show you the difference, the cost. These are all generic medications, but just to show you that when we prescribe 90-day supply, it's always more affordable, so then always try to do that. And again, these are the generic medications that you are all familiar with. We have Lumeparide, Lipicide, Metformin, and Glipicide, Sending Release. There are also combinations like Gliboride and Metformin and pioglitazone. So even the generic medications, they are more affordable when we prescribe 90 days. We are all familiar with the Medicare Part D gap, the donut hole. And there are several things that we can do to help poor patients not to get there. Even with medications that are covered, if we can help with coupons or any other way to help the patient, lower the cost because then that will remember even if it's a lower cost it builds up and then patients will reach the donut hole sooner so we want to try to delay that several ways to do this is to prescribe generic prescriptions to order 90-day supplies as i show you even with the generic medications the cost is always lower when we do 90-day supplies and to use coupons and manufacturer discounts. We will talk about these coupons a little in the next slides. I'm going to review some of the Medicare and Medicaid coverage for diabetes medications and supplies, for hypertension medications, and for lipid lowering medications because this is the cardiometabolic uh, session. And I'm just going to talk about the ones that we use the most. Of course, there are so many different options, but just kind of to get familiar with the most common ones and also where to find the information when you want to prescribe one of these medications. So here we have the P1 receptor agonist. This is the Medicaid in the state of Washington. You might already be familiar with this by experience because perhaps you wanted to prescribe one of these medications and that's how we usually find out. These are the medications that are preferred by Medicaid. Glutide is one that I use most commonly. 
the other medications, the other GLP-1 receptor agonists, they are not preferred depending on the plan. If you want to prescribe one of these, then the patients would have to have try one of the preferred ones and fail, either because it didn't lower A1C enough or because patient didn't tolerate it or had some side effects or, or contraindications. But these are the, the here you have these slides, so then you can always look and see what the preferred ones are. This is for the SGLT2 inhibitors. This is for Medicaid. Thankfully, they are covered. The only one that is not is at the glucosin. I haven't been in a situation where I specifically wanted the glucosin to be covered. I tend to prefer the options that we have that are preferred by Medicaid. These are the combination medications, LCLT2 inhibitors and metformin combinations. We always want to make treatment for our patients more friendly as difficult, especially when they feel that they are taking a lot of medications. A lot of my patients, the Latinx diabetes clinic, they just feel that they are just taking too many medications and nobody really loves that. One way to simplify regimens is to use these combinations. These are the ones that are preferred, canagliflosin and metformin, and the proglifosin and metformin extended release. If you were to want one that is not the preferred one, then you would have to do a prior authorization and explain why these other the preferred ones are not a good option. I'm just going to switch now to continuous glucose monitor. And now that we are talking about diabetes and continuous glucose monitoring systems are not covered. Some years ago, it was almost impossible for our patients with type 2 diabetes. But even if it is covered now, we still require documentation and there are several effects that, that what the patient needs to have in order for the CGMs to be covered. So we need, of course, the diagnosis, type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes, and the patient needs to be on intensive insulin management. So if the patients are on basal bolus regimens, then a CGM is strongly recommended and it is covered. But we need to specify that the patient is on intensive insulin management, that the patient is monitoring blood sugars, so there's more coverage now than in the past, but still in Washington, Medicaid, this is still a requirement and we need to document that. Also, it helps a lot if the more information we have about why the patient would benefit of a continuous glucose monitor, such as hypoglycemia and awareness, or if there is nocturnal hypoglycemia, then you want to document that because then your case is stronger to obtain a CGM. Also, if there are complications such as nephropathy, heart disease, so again, we are in the cardiometabolic panel here, so then we want to document all of that. If the patient has retinopathy or dexterity issues, so if the patient has Parkinson's or neuropathy, then you want to document that as well. And state that if the patient is unable to achieve glucose control despite all of the above, so the A1C is still high, and then the CGM would be a great tool. Medicare covers personal CGM when the patient has diabetes, when it's insulin treated with multiple three or more injections, when the regimen requires frequent adjustment, which when patients are on basal bolus, especially the bolus, the prandial insulin always frequently it depends on what the patient is eating or what the blood sugar is. So then the patient themselves are doing adjustments. And this is, all, this is very important. Within six months prior to ordering the CGM, the treating practitioner has an in-person visit. We need to explain to the patient that once they have the CGM approved, they need to be seen in clinic every six months because then otherwise then the coverage for the CGM might be interrupted. I had that unfortunately happen to some of our patients either because the visit was postponed or was canceled or, and the Medicare is very particular about this. So then we just need to understand that then once they have it, it is a prescription that needs to continue to be renewed and they need to be seen in clinic every six months. Now we are going to switch to hypertension medications. For hypertension medications, these are the combination medications that are preferred and this is the other of the combination medications that are not preferred if you were to want one of these, then again, you would have to state why these medications will be preferred ones, why they're not a good option or whether the patient has contraindications. 
ACE inhibitors, they are free wall covers. That's why I didn't really put them in here. I put some of the ones that kind of like particular cases. This is about neuronotocarendia. Dr. Aurora has more experience with this. I haven't prescribed this very much, but if you were to, your patient would benefit of this option. This is what you need to document. This is Bolina. You need to have a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease associated with type 2 diabetes, and you need to attest that the member that your patient is on a maximum tolerated ACE inhibitor, or if the patient has a contraindication on an allergy, the patient cannot be on these medications. Your patient needs to have a potassium that is less than 5 and for higher than 25 within the last month. So you need to have a recent renal panel and that the patient has tried and failed an SGLT2 inhibitor, or if the patient has a contraindication or an allergy to one of the to an SGLT2 inhibitor. And the label contraindications within the documentation, so use of strong C C3A4 inhibitor or patients with renal insufficiency. Now we'll move to the lipid lowering medications. Your status, atrophastatin is covered. But sometimes you might need, when patients are already on atorvastatin, for example, and you still don't have the lowering of the LDL that you are hoping for, you might need a stronger statin. That would be a reason to prescribe a stronger statin. Uh, or when the patient might not be able to tolerate such a high dose of atorvastatin, and you, again, need more of a lowering of the LDL, so then, then you might need a prior authorization. Just a reminder to always prefer to prescribe 90 day supplies for the medications. Uh, these are the, some of the fibrates and the medications that are used to lower triglycerides. These are the preferred fibrates. So we have germ fibrocell is the preferred fibrate, again, Molina. And these are the non preferred anti hyperlipidemic medications. When you feel that you need a non preferred medication, then you will need a prior authorization and again explain why the patient is not going to be able to tolerate the fibrocell or again whether there is a contraindication or an allergy or fail these medications. For PCSK9 with Molina, Parliament is the one that is preferred. I don't have a lot of experience with this myself, but we are going to the cases and when we talk future sessions, we are going to talk about this group of medications more and how to write prior authorizations for these medications. In general, is when patients uh, need further lowering of LDL when they're already on a statin or when they are unable to tolerate a statin, when they have kind of established cardiovascular disease and need, they need further LDL lowering effects. Moving on to coupons, most pharmaceutical companies have coupons, especially for the new medications. These coupons, you can find them online. So then whenever you want to prescribe a medication, you can just look it up, Google it really quick. Patients can look for coupons as well online. These coupons usually offer a 30 day trial. It's usually free. And this is mainly for commercially insured patients. Unfortunately, a lot of these coupons exclude Medicare and Medicaid patients, and many of these coupons offer 30-day trials followed by continuous saving, either a zero copay or a copay that is no more than $25. Then sometimes the patients are able to use these coupons for up to a year. Again, like most of these coupons are for commercially insured patients. Whenever possible, it's always a good idea to use these coupons because even sometimes if the copay is not like a lot, if we can save the patient some money, then that's always welcome. We also have patient assistance programs. Most pharmaceutical companies, they offer financial assistance for their medications, especially the medications that are new, that are very expensive applications that the patient needs to fill out. In our clinic, for example, we have the help of for PharmDs, they help the patient fill out these paperwork to see whether they qualify for this uh, help. It is very helpful for patients who are on Medicare, again, to help the patients not to get to the donor hole, and it does not count towards a Part D beneficiaries to out of pocket cost. But again, these programs are very helpful and always consider that uh, to help your patients. These are the references where you can find this information 
or information about other drugs, just to see what they prefer ones are or the requirements for what you need to document when you need to prescribe a medication that is not in the preferred drug list. Any questions? Some great points there, Lorena. Could you give us a specific example where you've been successful in advocating for a patient? Maybe share a personal experience? Yes, now, thankfully, a lot of the SGLT2 inhibitors that now are covered with the GLP-1s, we only have a clear glutide, but I had in the past wanted to have further weight loss, for example, and I feel that my patient would benefit more of semaglutide weekly, for example. Then I explain why my patient has already been in glutide. Rarely, I've been non-successful with this approach, but I really have to document why I need it, why it's important, so as much information as I can. For example, if I want it for further weight loss, and I explain that, but I also bring up their triglycerides, their A1C, and at times I might as much documentation as possible, uh, and I, I have successful with, with this approach. Great points there. And Portia, any words of wisdom, maybe commenting a little bit about a patient assistant program and anything that you found is helpful in getting that application filled out? Because not everyone is lucky enough to have a PharmMD to help with the process. It really requires a patient to fill out the form correctly too and make sure we have our prescriber section done. So we both of those need to be sent to the company and making sure that all the check marks have been marked because if they're missing something, the process can take a very long time. So I usually call the companies to make sure what is missing in case if there is anything that sometimes needs it to be done by the patient, like missing a signature or a income, some kind of information, something like that. So I think making sure that process is all done is very important. Great points as well. One caveat I want to make is that I think we've all heard the pharmacy has been faxing us the request for the prior authorization like a hundred times, but the fax seems to be eaten. So one thing I've gotten the habit of telling my patients is if you haven't been able to pick up the medication after 10 to 14 days, let us know that there's a barrier and then we can engage. I really think making sure we're all communicating well is a big part of the prior authorization. Do you think that's an okay expectation, that 10 to 14 business days? Or what would be your recommendation about that, Portia? Pharmacies, when they get the prescription, usually they will be able to find out pretty soon. It requires prior authorization. So if patient can fill within a couple of days, I suggest just having them contacting the clinic so we can start the prior auth process. Great. So you're saying if it's been over five business days and they can't pick up the prescription, that would be appropriate. So that's a great timeline. Allison Ward, our mental health expert, tell me any tips you have about helping patients engage in their health care, because I do think that sometimes we want to engage them to be self-advocates. Any key phrases you use for them or anything? Typically would require if there's a barrier, what are the barriers to their getting the treatment that they need? And to assist with that, there's also the matter of does the person actually believe that the treatment is going to be useful and worthwhile? What might be the negative side effects? Therefore, that might hinder what they want in terms of that. They might have other things to which they financially have to attend to. So they're having to do more of what's going to get you the most, I'm sorry, I'm about to use this phrase, I think just what I said, but more bang for your buck for the patient. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I love how you point out that they have to have buy-in. We can cheerlead for the medication, but if we're not really savvy about explaining the risk benefit of it and really explaining why we think it's going to be beneficial, but also the risks so that they're comfortable, they're not going to be on board and they're probably not going to engage to start that medication. That might be one of the most important points of the session today. Great point there, Allison. We have now a great case that will be coming up. Dr. Siegel, Gabriella, are you available? Sure, thank you. And just to introduce myself, I'm Gabriella Siegel. I'm a family doctor at CMAR Seattle. I'm going to share a case. One of my patients, she's a 61 year old female who I met a little over a year ago in 2021. She has type 2 diabetes. It was pretty well controlled then. 
And the reason I'm choosing this case is because over the course of the past year, I had just seen that her A1C was creeping up. And this was all in the setting of a work injury. She was working as a housekeeper and had an accident. And as a result, had a rotator cuff tear. And then she had surgery to repair it. And basically, it tore again. She had a lot of chronic pain, plus was no longer able to work and a lot of stress around applying for disability, financial stress from all of that. Luckily, after changing her regimen and starting her on Lyraglutide, her diabetes control has improved significantly over the past few months, but just wanted to bring up the case and how to support patients who are dealing with a lot of stress outside of their diabetes. I also wanted to touch a little bit on tips for talking about titrating her lyraglutide and her lipid management. So just to talk a little bit more about her history, she has type 2 diabetes, hypertension, NASH or MASH, this rotator cuff injury, and also developed an arthritis from that injury and surgery. For her medication list, she's on metformin, sustained release 1,000 milligrams twice a day, liraglutide 0.6 milligrams daily, amlodipine 10 milligrams daily, lisinopril 40 milligrams daily. Recently started a chlorthalidone 12.5 milligrams daily. And I forgot to include, she's also on a torvastatin 80 milligrams daily. With her, in terms of prior meds, with her history of MASH, we had to trialed pioglitazone, but she did not tolerate that, said she had pretty significant lower extremity swelling and fatigue, which resolved after stopping it. She has a family history of type 2 diabetes and her mother and two sisters. Also, her mother has a history of hypertension and cancer. No known history of heart disease in the family. I mentioned she was working in housekeeping and is not working due to her to her shoulder injury. She's a high school graduate, moved to the US from Mexico in the 80s. She's married, no tobacco use, just social alcohol use. In terms of her vitals, her BMI last visit was 33.6. That she actually had almost a 10 pound weight loss over the course of I believe it was a month and a half or two months. And her blood pressure is 142 over 83. Heart rate is normal. And you can see her labs pointing out this increase in her A1C. And most recently, it was 6.9% just last month. Her creatinine was normal. I just mentioned her LDL is 159. And her LFTs back in January were elevated, but her June labs, her AST normalized and her ALT was 40. You can see her, she's up to date with foot exam, retinal, and we do the PHQ2 depression screening every visit. And she is seeing a dentist. She did meet with our health educator just a couple months ago and had declined meeting with our nutritionist. She felt pretty confident in some of the diet changes that she made. One of the biggest barriers we identified with her diabetes care was the financial barrier, not being able to work, and then this chronic pain and disability. I don't have a lot of information about what her diet looked like before, but we talked about what she was currently doing and she has been really focusing on having protein with her meals and whole wheat, wheat bread and not drinking any sweetened beverages, having snacks with fiber in them. So that's pretty much it. Gabriella, great presentation there. I'm going to ask Allison, do you have any clarifying questions for her? Perhaps we're waiting for Allison. Lorena, do you have any clarifying questions for her? I was very impressed by the A1C lowering. In a couple of months, it just improved mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, so it was that because you did add earlier glutide, right? Mm -hmm. And then yeah. the dietary changes. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I read that correctly because that's impressive. Good job. I think once she 
got a better handle of what was going on with her disability case, you could see that she was a lot more engaged in focusing on her diabetes management and walking more. And the liraglutide, it actually wasn't, wasn't started until May. That was just a month after her A1C was over 11%. All of that change from the 11 to 8 point something was her diet changes and starting to exercise more. And she's currently on 0.6, right? That is still a low dose. That was actually going to be one of my clarifying questions. Did you see her weight loss occur from the uncontrolled diabetes when her sugars were so high? Or did the weight loss occur as she changed her lifestyle, as you just pointed out, once you had more security with the disability claim and everything? The weight loss only came after her A1C was already improving and after starting the liraglutide. Great. Allison, did you have any questions for Gabriella? Yeah, I was wishing to clarify, is she uh, literally receiving disability or is she still having to deal with a workers' comp claim? And if so, is there a voc rehab counselor involved? She is, as of our last visit in June, it had her disability had not been approved yet, so she was still waiting to hear back. And I'm not sure about her having a counselor going through that. She is going to a specific workers clinic who's been managing L and I. Great question, Allison. And Laura, do you have any questions for Gabrielle before you start to lead our case discussion? No, a few that'll come out when we start the case. Okay, great. We'll go ahead and answer some of those clinical questions that Gabriella had. Gabriella, one question that I had is her immobility right now, you said she's really changed her lifestyle. Tell us in the setting of her disability, what she's been successful at, because it's always great to share that with our own patients, little changes despite limitations. So what worked for her? Because she's lost some weight and everything. She's really been focusing on daily walks with her husband. She has some limitation with doing anything with her upper extremities. And I suspect that as the weather was getting better, it was a lot easier for her to get back into walking. Great, thanks. But to recap the case then, we have a 61-year-old female with class one obesity with her a body mass index of 33. Her obesity-related comorbidities include well-controlled type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension, and she's on three agents. She experienced worsening diabetes control in the setting of chronic pain, emotional and financial stress resulting from her work injury, which caused disability. Our question specifically, we're going to talk about how can we maximize her weight loss and then what's the next step for lipid management when she's already on a high intensity statin as well. And her current med list, which you guys already saw there, I added that atorvastatin on there because it was missed, I think, in the original presentation. The individual patient characteristics, again, she has a BMI of 33.6, GFR, let's just add up all these things here. Her A1C, as we discussed, improved. And can you clarify again, how much weight did she lose on the, in the last month then? Almost 10 pounds. 10 pounds. Okay, great. So her BMI was over 35 at one point? Yes. All right. We've got some weight loss. She's made some changes, more walking, it sounds like, and mental health sounds like she's doing a little bit better now that she's got more clarity in her work situation. Her hypertension, she's on three agents. Her blood pressure is still a little bit elevated at 142 over 83, and she has some liver issues as well. And one of our talks later on is going to be focused on that as well. So the case today, we're not going to focus so much on that aspect. Our first question, which is the standard question that we talk about in every echo case, but does this patient produce insulin? Is she type one or type two or insulin resistant? And from all of the data gathered, she definitely seems like she's probably mostly type two. What is her A1C goal? Less than 7% ideally, but she's a young female. So if we can get her less than 6.5, that might be more ideal, especially if she's not going to run into any issues with hypoglycemia. In previous echoes, you've probably heard this before too, but if we can put her goal as less than 6.5, that might open up the ability to maybe get her on other medication agents, especially if our target is 
6.5 and she's still hovering around seven. So it might help improve her access. Nicole, did you have any other things to add about her goal and from an endocrinology perspective? Yeah, I think, especially when patients are less than 65, if I'm not worried about hypoglycemia, I do try to aim for that tidal glycemic control. It's not always because of pure risk for complications. What it does is it opens up avenues for advocating for additional medications if we want things for cardiac, renal, and weight loss benefits. So there are underlying things that we're really trying to help in someone who's living with a chronic disease like diabetes. So this patient was Medicaid and she did great on the lorutatide. Then her weight loss at a plateaued, her A1C was at seven. I might advocate for a weekly GLP-1 by saying the lorutatide was a treatment failure because my goal is six and a half given her younger age. And that's a way to get the medication. Whereas if you just say you want it for weight loss, it's not gonna occur. That was one of the questions in the chat. I did wanna just point that out. What was her A1C again? I don't have the slide in front of me. Her A1C. Her last A1C was 6.9. Okay. So we could definitely advance the goal potentially. And I had some clarifying questions. Is she taking all of her meds, especially thinking about the statin because she's still having some issues. Do you have any concerns about compliance? It's something I would always check in about. And she always reported taking her meds. And per the PDMP, it looked like she was always filling her prescriptions. Great. And we already talked that she's got some weight loss and she lost, do you think it's about 5% weight loss so far? Because she lost about 10 pounds. I'll calculate that exactly. Does she want more weight loss? Is that part of what your interaction has been with her? She was very excited about the weight loss. It's not something she's specifically expressed. I want to lose more weight, but it was definitely a really positive change for her. Perfect. Just in general with her other health conditions, I'm sure that weight loss is very advantageous for her. And if we can definitely get 10 percent weight loss, all of the benefits that can do. And the dose, so you've only stuck with 0.6. Did she have trouble advancing the dose higher of the liraglutide or? We haven't tried to increase the dose, but she tolerated that dose really well. Okay, great. And do you know if she does have some appetite reduction as well? Did you say that? Not sure specifically about her appetite. Okay, perfect. And then sleep, any concerns, sleep apnea? I did refer her to sleep medicine for a sleep study. Okay, great. And then for behavioral health, I think you mentioned she has some counseling with the workers' compensation facility, but is she linked up with your social worker in your clinic or any other mental health support? I was actually looking back at my chart notes over the past few encounters, and we had talked about behavioral health, and she was adamant, I don't feel like I'm depressed. I'm just really overwhelmed with all of this stuff going on. So she had declined a behavioral health referral. All right. Then her PHQ-9, I know we do that all the time in primary care. Do you remember, was it her last one, mild, moderate, or severe? Could it suggest that maybe there is some depression? She didn't score it. Yeah, so I would have to check it, even if it did flag, if she had declined to fill out the PHQ-9, because that uh-huh. can happen sometimes. Gotcha. I know in primary care, we don't always get to this, but for weight loss too, I always think about disordered eating. Is there ever a concern about binge eating or has that ever been something that you've been worried about? Not something that's come up for her. And any medications previously for mental health? She had taken trazodone a few years ago for Uh, sleep. Okay. All right. Great. So for our non- pharmacologic intervention. I broke it down into three categories. We've got a lot of stuff to cover, so I might not get into every detail. And Allison, our expert, is definitely going to talk a little bit more about behavioral health. It sounds like she's in a better place now, but just with her chronic pain and maybe connecting with social worker could be potentially beneficial. Sleep is so critical, certainly for a lot of aspects, her blood pressure, you're referring her for that, the sleep study, but during the night when we sleep on a circadian rhythm, we do secrete leptin and leptin helps us with appetite regulation and leptin also regulates our GLP. So it's just absolutely critical, especially when someone's trying to lose weight. Certainly I would encourage just emphasizing good sleep hygiene and I'm glad that you've connected her to the sleep clinic. I did include a reference, which is really cool and interesting to read just talking about how sleep ties in with this insulin resistance specifically. For her exercise, I think I missed that clarifying before. So now she's able to walk, you said, and is she tracking steps specifically or? 
she doesn't track her steps, but she does 30 minutes to an hour daily. Oh, great. Perfect. And then her upper extremity, though, is it her left, right? What is she able to do with that? It's her left shoulder. She said she can do her household with some difficulty, but yeah, she's okay. still able to manage. Okay, great. And then any muscle conditioning or strength training? She had been going to PT, but oh. she's not. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So we all know in primary care, our recommendations for activity, the 150 minutes, it sounds like she does have more ability, but a physical therapist or a personal trainer, if she, again, financially, maybe that's not feasible, but a physical therapist, uh, I'd still recommend that. But in obesity medicine, actually tracking steps, because many of our patients that we see may be more sedentary. So it's really daunting to say, oh, I need you to do 150 minutes a week. So tracking steps can be a really helpful tool and maybe for her, not particular because she's already walking 30 minutes to an hour, but starting maybe 2,000 steps and then gradually building. If she can get 5,000 to 10,000 steps a day, that's really a great intervention as well for her diabetes and overall metabolic health. For the nutrition piece, I think you mentioned she declined seeing the dietitian. Yeah, how was that interaction? I think especially with all of these other things she had to keep track of and seeing the workers clinic and ortho it was uh, just she didn't want to have to worry about seeing another person for something else gotcha which i think it could have also been a similar case with behavioral health gotcha she pr felt pretty good about the changes she had already made Perfect. And I think from her review, it definitely sounds like she's got a good routine and I wouldn't recommend any specific restrictive diet, obesity management and weight loss maintenance. It's difficult and whatever the patient does now, we want them to be able to do forever. Really sticking with just general lifestyle changes. You mentioned protein, each meal, each snack. However, I would say just in my experience, when we start using these stronger tools that are going to maybe reduce appetite more, if that's what we decide to do for weight loss, there's definitely could be risks for other vitamin deficiencies and protein malnutrition. So support and accountability is really important. And ideally it could be with a dietitian, but potentially having her still work with a dietitian, especially if she, some of those other things are taken care of might be helpful just so we can make sure she's getting enough. Actually, I did include some information that you guys can look at after I'm not going to go through in detail. The obesity algorithm is very similar to the ACE guidelines as well in terms of just general nutrition guidance. Next, I'm going to have Allison jump in and give us some advice so we can give you some recommendations for the mental health piece. Um, I actually have a question, Laura, for you. When I looked at this patient's diet or her, what she had eaten in a given day, it seemed like there was a lot of calorie restriction. And my concern, and maybe this is what you brought up, is how can she sustain this? That's the thing. I always tell patients calories is easy once we get patients on GLPs or fentramine, and it's really making sure they get enough. So I imagine she is still getting a pretty good amount of appetite suppression, even from 0.6. So if we switch her to semaglutide, that might even get worse. On these meds, it can be sustainable. So again, nutrition to make sure she's getting enough. Okay. And I guess the idea is that you just will continue with her on this medication as part of her diabetes management. Yeah, because the concern is, and we know patients with obesity and diabetes, their GLP levels are lower. And to some extent, we know GLP decreases during weight loss. So if we take that away from her for weight loss in particular, she'll regain everything. And our body does adapt through metabolic adaptation. Hunger signals will pick up. So if we did her assessment on 0.6 in six more months, we'll probably find she's consuming more calories. All right. First of all, I actually found it very interesting that this woman has four medical conditions that are actually exacerbated by psychobehavioral processes. In fact, even from a psychosocial perspective, each of these medical conditions actually have their own unique and specific aspects that are going to influence their adjustment. I'm just going to go through these very quickly in regard to depression and diabetes and people with type one, type two diabetes, about 27% of individuals with type two diabetes have depression or some type of major clinically significant depressive disorder. The reason why it's particularly important with people with type 2 diabetes is because there is this bi-directional relationship, some of which is based actually on lifestyle and also based on what it means that in terms of the burden of having to manage 
type two diabetes. I just wanted to also point out, there's also the concern about anxiety and diabetes and with almost 20% of people with diabetes meeting criteria for generalized anxiety disorders. And that's actually even higher than what it is in the general population. It's also known to be higher in the Latinx community. I did also note the body dysmorphic disorder because it can be a concern for people with diabetes and then people obviously who are obese. And I also wanted to point out again, one of the more particular considerations for people with diabetes that probably is more meaningful for more of your patients is dealing with diabetes distress. It has a higher prevalence rate than it does in depression and anxiety. And yet it is also quite influential in terms of how a patient approaches their diabetes care. I wanted to just focus on the idea of chronic pain because that's one of the concerns she has. And it's actually a little bit more immediate even though she's had a history of arthritis. She's had this recent work-related injury, which really can be life-changing. So when it comes to patient care, I think that providers would benefit from considering diabetes self-management and weight loss and weight management efforts within the context of a patient's chronic pain condition. This includes report of pain intensity and mood, like depression, pain beliefs, perceived and actual disability, their extent of physical functioning, return to work options, and their financial status, because these are going to influence a patient's engagement in these other medical conditions and the health promotion aspects of it. The biopsychosocial perspective is often applied to highlight the multidimensional nature of chronic pain and to explain the psychological and social and biological factors, all of which combined can contribute or influence the maintenance, development, and exacerbation of that person's pain experience. So patients often speak to the negative effects of chronic pain on their physical, emotional, and overall well-being as well as on social relationships, work functioning, maintenance of other important social roles, financial stability, among other challenges. It's not also uncommon for people with chronic pain to report frustrations with the healthcare system and public and private health insurance systems, which are often unsympathetic to or unsuccessful in adequately addressing their complaints. Therefore, chronic pain is also much diabetes. It has a significant burden associated with it. Typically, people showing in clinical settings who have chronic pain, about 50% of them actually have a major depressive disorder. Research indicates that high levels of just overall stress, like this one you reported about having this woman, depression and catastrophizing and low levels of acceptance of their pain experience has a negative impact on their pain outcome and quality of life. As I've shown here in the pain cycle, that there's so many aspects of one's life that is influenced by one's injury and pain experience. So when we think about the idea of pain management, it's really also important then to look at all of these aspects. As a former pain psychologist, all of these things are so important to be addressing as part of the person's pain management treatment, and that it's actually presented as being a part of that person's pain management treatment. I have a list of things to consider. I would recommend that you learn more about what is this work clinic, what is the extent of OT, PT, and folk rehab services that she's receiving. I would want to follow up with, is she still on workers' comp? Because that is a pain and very stressful for people. Often gets in the way of our ability to treat our patients well, because they're quite focused on, it's just a huge stressor. And I think that's really helpful because you might have a better idea of, does she view herself as being disabled physically? And is she really actually not? So is there actually a return to work option for her that maybe her LNI claims manager is actually pushing for? You might want to just monitor that. And then these are just some other things to consider in terms of screening measures. One of the things I wanted to say that you might consider doing is looking at how much catastrophic thinking she might have around her pain experience. Often patients exaggerate what it means to, in terms of what is their pain experience about? What is the pain intensity? They might be thinking more about this is really terrible and that they're feeling really helpless as a result of their experiences. 
and that this actually is a strong predictor in terms of understanding the pain intensity, sense of psychological disability, and sense of a physical disability as a result. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. I know part of this picture is really complicated by her pain and how that impacted diabetes control and mental health. We did add some information. I'll let Nicole add a few comments about this aspect as well. I would say that since I only see diabetes now, more and more, every time I see a patient, I'm asking them about whole body health and mental health. And more and more, I feel like I am prescribing medication to support a uh, mood. And I'm finding that in chronic pain, if I can use something so that it targets both, A, they're more likely to take the medication and then it's less pill burden and also a support of the patient. There may be less stigmatism to taking a medication that is for chronic pain, but also helps with your mood depression. So I've definitely started to look at the SNRIs a little bit and I'll start a low dose and I'll also say, oh, make a follow up with your primary care so that we can work on it together and we can taper this medication for effect. And if it doesn't work for you, we try something else. I want people to be aware to think about it this may not be the right choice for this patient, but definitely the loxidine effects are, are weight neutral in general. What we've talked about in our other discussions, it will help support her weight loss goals, but it also might improve her mobility and her overall mood. And it's also another non-stigmatizing way of talking about it in terms of pain. I've talked to my psychiatrist colleague and he feels that low doses, the tricyclics don't cause a lot of weight gain. I tend to avoid them. I think the benefits to the tricyclics are definitely for people with sleep issues. They tend to make you a little sleepy and drowsy, and then they help as well with chronic pain. But it's just something to take into effect if weight loss was a positive motivating factor. If we even minimize that a little bit, it might take away some of her forward, forward movement. So I did want to point that out. Just a comment about the tricyclics. I would say all the meds still could have a potential for weight gain, but I definitely agree with Nicole that some less so than others. And then with the amitriptyline, sometimes switching to nortriptyline, that's actually recommended for weight neutrality. So nortriptyline may be less weight promoting than amitriptyline if you did use that. One of your questions was how can we maximize her weight loss while we are still maintaining her glycemic control? If we're going to put her control, we're going to have the A1C goal of less than 6.5. She's already on her liraglutide. She's on this GLP-1 receptor agonist and liraglutide is excellent. She's still on a pretty low dose. So certainly we could start to advance the dose up to the maximum of 1.8. But we do know from several of these trials that semaglutide is still going to be the highest or the most beneficial, even compared to liraglutide or the other GLP agonists. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about these as well. But just generally, if we're wanting more weight loss, probably switching her to semaglutide might be much stronger. I also did just think about other options, especially if she does want weight loss, but her blood pressure is a little bit elevated. It's not crazily high. I probably would avoid contrave because the bupropion might raise her blood pressure. The fentramine could raise the blood pressure and even Qsimia, which has fentramine in it, it could still be used. And I know Nicole, who does some weight management as well, I'll have her comment on that too. Any thoughts on the anti-obesity medications? I think the most common medication I use outside of the GLP-1 receptor agonists in my diabetes patients are fentramine. And at first, because of the mood issues and then also the risk for raising the heart rate a little bit and blood pressure, I was more cautious about it. But I found the positive effects and just the positive reinforcement of getting a little bit more weight loss weighs that sort of slight risk. And you usually get then blood pressure benefit as you have weight loss. So I would definitely not start someone with truly uncontrolled hypertension, like 150, 160 systolic. But if she's 140 and you just started an additional therapy on her, I'd probably be comfortable with that and just want her to have follow-up to monitor the blood pressure as well. I have not had great effect with the naltrexone malbuprotin just because most of my patients tend to get nauseous from it. So it tends to be a more limiting medication. So I don't have as much experience with that, but I agree. It doesn't sound like she's on chronic pain medication, but I do have a few patients on opioids that I have used lower dose fentramine and, and they've done well with it and they've lost the weight and it's helped them decrease their chronic opioid use as well. So those are my thoughts on that.
Perfect. And we're going to talk next week a little bit too about fentramine in more detail because it's definitely a scary medication when you first start prescribing it. But uh, yeah, I think highest percentage of weight loss and also to release the burden of medications, I think a weekly GLP could do what's needed for weight loss and glycemic control. I did want to just make a comment about metabolic surgery versus medical therapy. I know a lot of patients come in and they always think metabolic or bariatric surgery is the last resort, but it is a surgery for treatment of type 2 diabetes. For this patient, her BMI is less than 35. Technically, looking at the guidelines, over 30 with type 2 diabetes, she could be considered for metabolic surgery, but it depends on insurance. So there could still be some barriers, but it's still something we could think about potentially as a treatment of her diabetes and for additional weight loss. Surgery metabolically, the way it works is when people have a sleeve or bypass, part of what it does is it's going to shift and increase the GLP hormone. The bypass is going to do that much more than the sleeve, but it is going to be a more permanent fix. For this patient, because she's got some mental health issues going on, and I would say maybe that wouldn't be my first thought, and she's already getting such good weight loss with her GLP agent, I wouldn't probably rush to that. Any of your patients, or even when you saw her initially with a BMI of 36, we could definitely think about that. So it's just not a last resort. And looking at some of this data, like diabetes can go into remission, which is pretty amazing. Next, we're going to move on and talk a little bit more about lipids, but also we want to include our expert nephrologist and have a little bit more of a discussion on blood pressure. So this is going to be the last section that we're going to talk about. Nicole? What do we know? We know because of her comorbidities and her uncontrolled high blood pressure and age, she's at risk for stroke and heart attack. So we really do want to optimize those things. What do we know already? She just started three agents for her blood pressure medications. We wanted to applaud you because we've talked that don't over hydrochlorothiazide tends to have more blood pressure lowering effect and is a preferred diuretic. So you already made the right choice for the blood pressure medication. Our question for Dr. Aurora is just, if she maximizes the diuretic, what would be your next choice for this resistant hypertension in her case? The short answer is if you need more blood pressure control, either you're going to increase the chlorothaladone, which is at the starting dose right now, or you're going to add spironolactone. From the Pathway 2 trial, we know spironolactone is going to be your first-line agent for, quote, resistant hypertension. I didn't see a potassium here, but this is, of course, assuming that the serum potassium could tolerate a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. That being said, we've talked about this before. The biggest crux in blood pressure management is, do you believe the number? Is that true? We've talked before that clinic pressures are inaccurate. We shouldn't be using clinic pressures to determine treatment for these folks. Every study has shown that clinic pressures can overestimate systolic blood pressures by up to 50 millimeters mercury because they're just not done correctly. Either you have to do them with appropriate technique yourself or rely on home blood pressures or in some cases, 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, particularly when we're already talking about how her blood pressure may influence other treatments for her. And then as was already echoed, sleep apnea is a big concern and that alone may help her blood pressure considerably if she has it and that's controlled. The other pearl that I usually talk to people about is chlorothaladone, 100%, the best size I diuretic you can use here. It's a tiny pill, so prescribing 12.5 milligrams a day can be really hard for patients. It's almost impossible to split, so you ultimately just end up with a little powder. If it's one thing I will do for patients, if I need them on the lower doses, do 25 milligrams every other day. Great points, Nayan. We're just going to talk a little bit with our last few minutes about her lipids. I had phoned a friend, so our lipid expert actually weighed in on this. Her first clarifying question was, what was her LDL before you started the atorvastatin at 80? She had already been on the atorvastatin 80. Yep. Can we look back? Because the question mm -hmm. is, it sounds like from what you said, she's filling her medication, she's taking it, but sometimes there is intermittent use of it. And with all the stress going on in her life, that might've been something that fell off. What we really want to see is where she was at baseline because she probably would have been close to 200. So that would be a marker of familiar hypercholesterolemia, at least heterogeneous for it. But I think in a non-judgmental way and just really 
showing her this and saying, you're doing so well with everything else. Let's just repeat it in two months. I bet given how she's excited about all the positive things that are going on, if she hasn't been taking it, it might be just the best first step. I just want to make a comment because sometimes our Latinx patients, because she has done such improvements in her diet, I would make sure that she's taking it. I would ask different ways because sometimes they make changes and they are eating so much better. She is that she might feel that she doesn't need a medication to lower cholesterol. Great point, Lorena. And I was going to ask you to weigh in on this as well, because that was my thought as well, because she's made so many good changes. And so again, just having an open conversation is the right way to go with this patient. Our lipid experts, similar to what I was thinking, you do get maybe a little bit more bang for your buck from statin 40, although maybe not that much. So it wouldn't be the wrong thing if it's not cost prohibitive to do that. And then the next step is to add the azetamide for additional lowering. Portia, could you comment? How easy is it or how much more expensive does it typically do a combination of the statin with the azetamide just so that her pill burden doesn't get greater? It's hard to know depending on the insurance too, but usually the combo medications are more costly. She has regents, I think. Oh, she has regents, yeah. They're typically more costly because they usually come in as a brand name product rather than the generic. So we would have to run the test claim to find out exactly how much it would cost. Yeah. And so that does take extra burden, I think, and resources from the clinics. But I think in some patients who are just overwhelmed by number of medications and there's a positive reinforcement of decreasing the pill number, sometimes that's where the effort is needed. And we'll let you know what the final recommendations if a combination medication is covered by her insurance. So that would be the next step. My lipid expert did not recommend this newer agent. There is some studies that show a synergistic effect with it, but she has found that there is just a significant risk for muscle aches and muscle side effects. You can see the meta-analysis did show muscle-related incidences increasing in the combination therapy. So with someone dealing with chronic pain, probably not the best choice. The other thing to highlight about this particular class of medications is it has been associated both with increased uric acid levels and also tendon rupture, including the rotator cuff. So probably not the right choice for that reason as well for this patient. That would not be a, a good choice for her lipid management. Then the other thing we wanted to comment on was her blood pressure is more elevated, but is it the chicken or the egg? Is her pain causing her blood pressure to be elevated? And so if we can treat the pain is her blood pressure going to get better or is it her anxiety? All those things contributing to it. And we did point out that some of the chronic pain medications that also help mood can slightly raise the blood pressure. We just wanted people to be aware of that if that is a decision we make. Again, we're not on maximum dose of our blood pressure medications. We just want people to be aware of the potential good and bad things about the medications we're choosing. Nyan, you had a comment. Could you go ahead and let us know? You just wrote something in the chat box. Go ahead. The question was about the efficacy of endapamide. I didn't mention that. But we don't have it here as much it's not on formulary for us it is equivalent essentially in efficacy to chlorothaladone and both chlorothaladone and endapamide are infinitely better than hydrochlorothiazide i'll be very happy if nobody ever uses hydrochlorothiazide again great thanks laura is going to go ahead and summarize things and we'll conclude session eight which has been a great session so go ahead laura yeah, I learned so much myself, a great session, but I think we definitely would consider switching her to semaglutide. She has regents, so there shouldn't be any issue switching her. She's still on a pretty low dose of her liraglutide, so I probably would still start her on a really low 0.25 milligrams weekly of her semaglutide. And there are some savings cards for sure that she could access if the copay is higher. We talked so much about how important behavioral health is. Definitely involve a social worker. If she is having depression, we talked about maybe adding some medications that could also help with her pain and mood at the same time. Sleep, so critical, but you've already got a good plan for that. Get her sleep study. And if she's got sleep apnea, that might help her blood pressure. With nutrition, especially for weight loss, I know a lot of patients are like, I know what I'm doing, I just need to do it. Accountability and support are critical, but also we want to make sure she's getting enough. Like Allison pointed out, is she really eating? She's not really getting that much. And her meds are probably keeping her appetite that tightly controlled. The dietitian is really helpful to make sure that the patients are getting enough nutrition. She's already been doing her physical therapy, but you could definitely re-engage physical therapy. Maybe tracking steps could be another way that the patient can keep up with her activity. 
we've already talked about maybe reducing the pill burden. So I, I, Portia, if you have any comments, but I think that's something that we'll look at for you to see if we can recommend some combinations based on your insurance. We were going to talk a little bit about the patient assistance program, but we'll just send that in the recap. And I just want to say this ends session eight of the Cardiometabolic Echo. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks all.